Okay. So there's a half hour set aside for sampling theory. I'm not going to use this at half hour. I think we can get the concepts without a lot of mathematical detail. So theory without theory. Okay. If you wanted the theory, um, don't, I don't really have time today to go into that. And I'd actually probably have to go back and relearn a lot of it myself. But I think we can get the critical concepts that will lead us down the right path of analysis. So there, there are some really critical points. I'm going to start sampling, right? Maybe I go out every day this week and watch birds instead of eating lunch. So one hour in Kirsten, Kirsten Bosch Botanical Gardens every day. And I do that until I'm done. Well, the first thing is I need to make sure my sampling is somehow consistent in space. So what if I go out the first five days I go that direction and the second five days I go that direction. <coughs> well, if there's any habitat difference, which is, which is to say if there's any really fine scale beta diversity, then those first five and second five samples are not comparable. Adolfo and I were surveying a site in central Peru in 2008 we didn't have a lot of time at the site. Um, but we worked there, I think, eight or nine days. And you know, the first day, wow, there were all these species we'd never run into. And the second day, more. And the third day, more. But by the fourth and fifth days, it starts to damp out. And by the eighth and ninth days, we were saying, OK, you know, we'd love to get more of this and more of this and more of this, but we're kind of almost done feels like we're getting done with this. And then that last day, one of our colleagues come in to camp, comes into camp with three species that we hadn't seen before. And I thought, excellent. Don't know how we missed them. That's great. And that afternoon, he goes out again and he comes back with two more species that we hadn't seen before. So finally I said to him, where are you going? Five new species when we thought we had detected most everything in the fauna. Now the Andes are very, very vertical and very divided up altitudinally as far as their faunas and floras. Well, there was a village just a kilometer down the road from our site and not wanting to be so obvious around the local people, although we were working with them, we were working essentially from our campsite up. Well, this colleague had walked past the village and gone down. So altitudinally, elevationally, he might have been 200 meters lower than our camp. And all of a sudden, he's getting new species for the inventory. So there's some in this case, elevational turnover, but it's beta diversity, and it made our sampling non-homogeneous. You know, the samples from the 10th day or the 9th day weren't comparable to the samples from the first eight days. Second thing is we need to make sure that our, our sampling is homogeneous in time. You know, maybe, I go out at lunchtime each day for an hour, but maybe on Friday, not, not wanting to miss Raphael's lectures, I only go out for 15 minutes. Well, my probability of detecting different species changes. And you're gonna see that that accumulation of effort through time becomes really critical in how we learn from these, these um, samples. So that's another one that's important. Essentially what we're talking about is that each sample has to be comparable to each other sample. It has to be kind of 
picking blindly from a pool, but without biases in what part of that pool of species I pick from. Otherwise, it's going to be very hard to make any conclusions from um, these inventory data. So essentially, we're after accumulating samples in a consistent and comparable way such that quantitative estimates can be derived from them. So that's essentially what we're going to have to focus on. But here, here's my theory slide. It's actually really easy. If I go out, I thought you'd like that, Thiago. <laughs> if I, I mean, th this is it, right? If I go out and sample a world, and all I find is cats and rabbits, lots of each, <coughs> how likely is it that there are 40 species in that fauna? I sampled nine. And all nine of my samples were one or the other of two species. But then, I go to a different place, I take nine samples, and I get all different. I mean, this is really simple. If you check something multiple times and you get a limited set of results, then you pretty much know how big the set is. But if you check something multiple times and you always get a different answer, there are probably a lot of answers out there. Yeah. Doesn't that also depend, um, thinking of a local example, certain sites, if you sample at the same time every day, you'll likely get a limited sample, but then you sample at night, and you get a completely different sample. So it also depends on how you plan your sample. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point. Day, night, summer, winter. Yeah, again, it all comes back to those samples have to be comparable. So you want to do your inventory in a circumscribed time period because essentially what you're always doing in these approaches is assuming that it's the same fauna or the same flora that you're sampling. If I go out into Kirstenbosch for a day during the day versus during the night, during the day I see those starlings out there and during the night I see owls or I hear owls. Okay, it's a different fauna that I'm sampling. Very good point. Um, so yeah, we have, to, we have to think very carefully about that. We can also think about doing that sampling hierarchically. I'll comment on that just a bit at the end. But we want to get to all of the species in our taxon. So we want the daytime, we want the nighttime, we want the spring, summer, winter, and fall. But we also want to build those sensibly into our into our estimates and our calculations, okay? So, there are kind of three levels of detail, and I'm going to ignore the most detailed set of, uh, of information, and that's this. Imagine that we have a list of species, and we have our samples, right? Could be today, tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, could be this minute, this minute, this minute, whatever. But species by samples. And in that matrix, we could have abundances, essentially numbers of individuals. Now that's clearly a very detailed data set. And in some cases, it makes sense. For example, if you are a, an entomologist, some groups of insects are best trapped with light traps. And assuming that you can identify all the species that fall in that light, light trap, and assuming that you have enough time to count all of the individuals of each of those species, then a fully fleshed out matrix is, is reasonable. In too many situations, those abundances can mean something else. They can reflect how many individuals of the species are out there, but they may also reflect 
um, how detectable the species is. I mean, this starling is sitting right outside the window singing. And probably every day I'm at Kirstenbosch, I'll detect it. But there may be another species that's way up in that brush and maybe doesn't sing, and I'll only see it if I get out there and, and prowl around in the brush. And so right away, my abundances for the starlings may be higher than my abundances for that secretive thing in the brush. And so, not in all cases, but in a lot of cases, a full matrix of abundances is going to be either prohibitively time expensive, example light traps where you might get a thousand individuals a night, or it might mix true abundance with detectability and things like that. And so I, I'm going to avoid that situation, but there are uh, situations where you can use those abundance data as well. More reasonable is just imagine if in each of our samples we can identify each species. It doesn't matter if we see a thousand of them or one of them. The question is that I see that species in that sample. Okay, so that's kind of a, a second level of, a, of detail. And then what was done for a long time was simply to look at the accumulation of species records. I'll give you an illustration of, of what that means in just a moment. Um, but essentially, for a long time, the way inventory completeness was dealt with was by species accumulation curves. I'm going to show you examples in a minute. And essentially, you start with zero samples and you've detected zero species. And in the first sample you detect a few, and in the second sample more. And eventually that curve starts to level off, 